the papers say. A weekly review of the daily papers. This week, the deputy editor of The Spectator, Brian Inglis. Good evening. That, they tell me, was me 25 years ago. All her yesterdays catching up on me. I was there as the outcome of a brainchild of the new Granada television, which had started operating in the spring of 1956. That was Brian Inglis, the first presenter of the first What the Papers Say. He was remembering the silver anniversary of the programme nine years ago. Now it's been going 34 years, and tonight it begins a new life on BBC Two. This is the heart of the programme in Granada Television, Manchester. Around me are five newspapers stretching back for a year. All the Sundays, all the national dailies, newspapers of right and left, broadsheets, tabloids, Scottish newspapers, local newspapers, evening newspapers, and at least a year's run of two dozen weekly magazines. They make up the lifeblood of the programme, which began in 1956, and news in the papers was the great worry before that first programme went on air. We knew that some mad government gambling scheme called Ernie was being introduced. Prize bonds go on sale today. That week, too, The Guardian's editor, A.P. Wadsworth, died. There was speculation about whether Tom Finney would keep his place in the England team, and that Diana Dawes was separating from her then-husband. But it was hardly the sort of stuff to launch a new programme. And then... British moving on Suez. Armada strikes after NASA spurns ultimatum. Big force of troops sail in landing craft at zero hour. 4.30 a.m. First wave of Red Devils reported landed. Commandos are spearhead. And if that wasn't enough... The murder of Hungary. Soviet tanks crush Hungarian rising. Budapest is blasted into silence. Remember, remember the 5th of November. I'm not likely to forget that one in 1956. Only the previous night, the last message from free, or nearly free, Hungary had come out over the tapes from Budapest, and we led that first programme with them. Out of Hungary yesterday came one of the most moving messages that a news agency has ever received. The last signal from the British United Press Office in Budapest before the Russians moved in. Goodbye. We do not forget you. The Russians are too near. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, friends. Save our souls. Nobody could have imagined on that first day that there were 1,653 weekly editions to follow because there have been dozens of other programmes which have looked at the press, communications and the media. But what the papers say has survived. It seems to have had longer legs than any of them. Why? Well, for me, it's because the programme was built on the bedrock of a simple, clear idea. And it must have appealed especially to Sidney Bernstein, the founder of Granada, and Dennis Foreman, the first producer of this program, both of whom were only too well aware of the open hostility of most of the British press to the newly established ITV. Going back to what I hardly dare describe as my filing system, I was surprised and gratified to find this memorandum which started it all. What the papers say, the basis of the show. Here in Britain it began... The daily press has enjoyed a freedom for many years to criticise any one or anything it chooses. On the whole, they have avoided criticising each other. Times have changed. Those were the days when the principle dog doesn't eat dog held good. It was rare for newspapers even to mention each other by name. Today, only the Telegraph keeps religiously to that principle, except when it announces gleefully that a rival is increasing its price. But the memo continued, Most readers regard the newspapers as an article of household furniture and would no sooner think of criticising it than they would a chair. I say things have changed. The saying, I saw it in a newspaper, is still tantamount to saying it's true. Ho oh, hum. On occasion, one or two sturdy voices, amongst them those of Aniron Bevan and Randolph Churchill, have made comments not wholly favourable. From time to time, the press council has issued a calculated and sanctimonious rebuke. But never have they... The newspapers, that is. But never have they been subjected to a regular critical survey in a medium as popular as their own. To wit, independent television. The budget for that first programme in 1956 was £171. Pounds. The journalist got a splendid, professional 25 guineas, and the voice, Bernard Ewans, got 12 guineas. That was before he went down market and became Stan Ogden in Coronation Street. And the programme was given a precise hospitality allowance of three pounds, two shillings and fourpence. The accounts department kept a cold fiscal eye on this last item with an early shot across the bows to the producer. 
How can a programme like what the papers say consume four pounds, three shillings and eightpence worth of snacks on November the 10th? Even the Welsh programme with a cast of thousands does not spend this much. Long before John Pilger, it pioneered the personal essay on television. It didn't set out to comment on the news, but how the news had been treated. It wasn't a home for lost causes, nor a platform for political or social debate. Nor was it simply, as many wrongly believed, a comic little picnic in the grounds of the Fourth Estate. It was, and is, a weekly critique of journalism, written by the presenter himself with wit, irreverence, mischief and insight, and its soon attracted names. Finally, I had no idea, until I saw the list of journalists who have written and presented this programme, how varied and sometimes distinguished they have been. Some have made their mark in other fields, such as politics, Richard Crossman, Michael Foote, Joe Grimmond, David Steele, Ian McLeod, who, had he lived, might have become Prime Minister, and in the present government, there's Nigel Lawson and Timothy Rosen. And many of the great editorial poobars of Fleet Street first appeared in this chair when they were members of the journalistic Hoi Polloi. Some died tragically young. At least one, Nick Tomlin, was killed in action. There were others, Hugh Cudlip, Randolph Churchill, Claude Coburn, David Frost, Jermaine Greer, Ludovic Kennedy, Bernard Levin, Malcolm Muggeridge, Robert Maxwell, Michael Parkinson. Indeed, when Mr. Nigel Lawson presented it in 1968, a look at the front page of his script shows that the floor manager was Mr. Eddie Sharn, who himself did one or two things in newspapers later. Because the programme was live, all of those have vanished into the ether, but some remain forever embalmed in ferric oxide. Eighteen years ago, Mr. Heath's government was prostrate before one of those absorbing disputes about dockers, three of whom faced prison to the infinite dismay of Mr. Heath. Strange legal gentlemen formed like ectoplasm out of nowhere. Some were for jailing the dockers, others were for keeping them free. A puzzled nation was led through the maze by a slim, articulate and savagely hairy Australian. The Express also ran a jokey little front page box about a character called the Tipstaff, whose job apparently was to put the arm on the rebel shop stewards. Though he isn't a big man, he's five foot seven inches, and at 50 is giving quite a few years away, the tip staff is determined to do his duty. The Telegraph also noticed that the tip staff was only five foot seven. Both papers neglected to mention that if the lone tip staff really planned to go up against these three heavies on an equal basis, he'd need to be about 18 feet high. The tip staff was a real discovery, one of those beautiful British heraldic back numbers like Black Rod, Red Spot, and the first usher of the bathroom but he only had one day in the limelight. By Saturday, another fairy tale figure had magically emerged, the official solicitor. Docker's jail move halted, wailed the telegraph with barely concealed impatience, and the Times front paged a picture of the official solicitor outside his herbaceous Berkshire cottage, from which, in response to no signal detectable to mortal ear, he had emerged to do his duty, like Mary Poppins. It was all my idea, thundered the express, meaning it was all his idea, the official solicitor's. Most of the papers agreed that the humble Heath was claiming no credit for this miraculous avoidance of a strike that would probably have had his government in deep trouble. But the Sun, for one, wasn't giving up. Who done it? They headlined and probed on tenaciously. Who stopped the dockers being arrested? Who asked the official solicitor to intervene? Come on, give. Was it the government? If it wasn't, who was it? It was Algernon, the atomic android from Andromeda. Who was afraid of the big bad wolf? I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Sometimes the programme opened up unusual vistas on the press. George Melly, for instance, led the viewer into strange areas of the hot metal jungle. Does this sentence make any sense to you? Bow wow who? The blue cats ask an amazed Mick Wall. Or this? These are the dollies who mixed it with the macho music biz and lost. Or this? A wops bop, a loo bop. If they don't, then you aren't a reader of the popular musical press. But a vast number of people are. What do they get out of it? Are you missing much? A bit unfair to judge by the headlines, perhaps. Let's try a sustained chunk of prose. You know when you're crawling from light to light in the London traffic, there's not a lot to do but dream. Only the spasmodic burst of power from somebody's motorized ego breaks the pattern of thought. Though just once in a while, something hits the air, tracks the code hanger aerial, and fires the tinny radio speaker with life. Here's another blast on the agaphone. I'd forgotten that this feeling existed. I would thought it was an irreplaceable, slowly fading memory from those indescribable dream drug droid vision days. 
Maybe it's caprice. Maybe I really am losing my mind. If so, I prefer one moment of ecstasy and an eternity of hell to a lifetime of nebulous dissatisfaction. That's a description of a gig by a band called the Blue Orchids in Aylesbury. And the 60s had barely shuffled off stage when an early satirist grew waspish about a fashionable aspect of journalism at that time. All editors these days seem to assume that science, and in particular medical science, is good stuff to entertain the troops with. The Times has its own science column. On Monday it revealed, One drink of a tasteless liquid preparation of radioactive iodine is now the standard treatment for thyrotoxicosis. A fascinating piece of information that is new to me, for one. The Sunday Times, too, is always a brim with the latest medical news. On Sunday it revealed, A pacemaker helps the paralysed. An electronic pacemaker, which can be implanted in the neck, has brought new life to 11 paralysed patients. Previously, they were able to breathe only with the help of an iron lung, a mechanical respirator attached to a tube in the windpipe. Now they can breathe normally. The article explains... The transistor pacemakers were attached to the phrenic nerves and by applying electric impulses to them, stimulated the diaphragm, causing it to contract. I really cannot believe that the general reader is interested in this kind of information. Sometimes I begin to think the editors and staff of the posh Sunday papers must all of them be suffering from acute hypochondria. A morbid interest in disease is evident throughout the pages. The Observer gleefully reported on Sunday. Jaundice link with the pill. Doctors at Birmingham Maternity Hospital are investigating a possible connection between the contraceptive pill and jaundice in breastfed babies. So far, the popular press has not excelled itself in this field, but it has discovered one thing, that science constitutes a very useful cloak of respectability with which to cover the ugly head of sex which so frequently rears itself in the tabloids. When Miss 2071 feels romantic, she'll dial L-O-V-E. Mirror science editor Bedford peers into his crystal balls and reveals... Strip the clothes off a 20-year-old girl 10, 50 or 100 years from now and she will look just as she does today. A fantastic item of scientific information by any count. But this science editor is chock-a-block with good ideas. Not for him the boring details of the standard treatment for thyrotoxicosis. Researchers on both sides of the Atlantic also foresee a time when our so-called pleasures, including romance, will be on tap, simply by donning something like a spaceman's helmet with knobs on the outside. A curious vision indeed. And there must be quite a lot of us who would rather bear those knobs we have than fly to others that we know not of, if I may be allowed to paraphrase the bard. Not all was clarity and precision, alas. Peter Jay, financial editor at the Times 20 years ago, one of the founders of Breakfast Box, ambassador to the United States, felt that financial journalists like himself were insufficiently appreciated. So backed by a wealth of international reference, he set off on his mission to explain. In terms of sheer reporting thoroughness, of course, British papers, apart from the hugely competent Financial Times, can't hold a candle to papers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Frankfurter Allgemeiner, the Neuer Jerica Zeitung, and Le Monde. Le dollar continue à baisser. Das floating délire. But in terms of all-round coverage and analysis of the dollar crisis, the British press has benefited uniquely from the mushroom growth over the last 10 years of a distinctive brand of economic journalism. It has smashed through the old restrictive barriers in Fleet Street between reporting, feature writing, and leader writing. This means that the reader gets reporters who have to have the analytical powers of the leader writer, as well as leader and commentary writers who are active reporters. I'm biased against understanding that, but I suppose it could be me. Bill Grundy was one of the stalwarts of what the papers say. In 1972, there was extraordinary and lengthy press coverage, which ran for weeks, about one of the great national mysteries. My joy was unconfined when something I'd suspected to be true for many years was proved. Well, more or less, the entire staff of the Natural History Museum dissenting. I refer, of course, to that bonny wee lassie, Nessie. Nessie raises her ugly head again. What an ungallant lot at the Sunday Times. Belief in the existence of the Loch Ness Monster grew so firm yesterday that naturalists, led by Sir Peter Scott, were already talking of saving it from extinction. Well, it's nothing like looking ahead, is there? Ladbrokes, meanwhile, shortened their odds against Nessie's discovery to six to one. Ah, to hell with science. Bookies are good enough for me. Plans were laid to reveal Nessie to a startled world at a scientific convention in Edinburgh next month. But yesterday's Boston Globe leaked the claim of Dr. Robert Rhines... He's the president of the Boston Academy of Applied Science. ...that he had photographic proof of a community of monsters, each 20 feet long, possibly descended from a 70-million-year-old prehistoric creature called the Plesiosaur. Look, before we go any further, can we get something straight? The Plesiosaur isn't 70 million years old. It never was. It's just that it was thought to have been extinct for the last 70 million years. Got it? Well, the Scottish nationalists haven't. 
Hands off, it's our beastie. Scottish nationalists yesterday warned off would-be Loch Ness monster hunters. As tourist officials looked forward to a boom season next summer, an SNP spokesman said in Edinburgh... Just as it's Scotland's oil, it is Scotland's monster, or monsters too. Like the salmon in the rivers let out to Sassanax at exorbitant rates that Scotland's do? If it does turn out to be a plesiosaur, then it has existed upwards of 70 million years. No one has a right to disturb it now. It's the Sleeping Beauty all over again. The last to kiss it on the lips is a cowardly custard. What am I saying? Sleeping Beauty? The head was ugly. Gargoyle was the word that came to mind. It was hideous, angular, bony and revolting. A bottle of champagne, if you can guess correctly which politician that reminds me of. Papers had been transmitting for a lively eight years when a new era in tabloid journalism was born. In 1964, its sister programme, World in Action, celebrated that birth with gusto. Born this day to Hugh Kinsman Cudlip, a son. Yesterday, they ignored the warnings of the stars and published a new newspaper. Yesterday, the sun was born under the sign of Virgo. Study the financial situation carefully. Patience is better than taking a risk just now. Do not take on new projects, but get yourself well organized. Sun arise, she bring in the morning. Sun arise, bring in the morning. Flutter in the skirts all around. Sun arise, she come with the dawning. Sun arise, come with the dawning. Spreading all the light all around. A terrible beauty was born. But page three and press deliberations, profound and learned, on all manner of sexual congress became part of journalistic enterprise. Again, Clive James on tabloid coverage of a curious fashion in sexual semaphore. Monday's mirror, not to be outdone, came up with a page three teaser about Italian housewives. Grapefruit sex code. Who are the housewives? They are housewives who are selling themselves. For what? For sex. And how they attract their custom? They attract their custom by displaying prominently on their shopping trolleys a transparent package of grapefruit. Can you beat that? Neither could the sun, but on Tuesday they had a good try. Omo is adding not only brightness to the sex lives of lonely housewives. OK, what else is Omo adding to the sex lives of lonely housewives? For an innocent-looking packet of Omo is a clear come on for the wives' secret lovers and the door-to-door -door salesmen who like to mix business with pleasure. Why is it a clear come on? For the letters O-M-O -O are a code, meaning... Old man out. I begin to comprehend. But how does the lonely housewife flash the message? <laughs> the love-hungry wife displays a packet of Omo in her window or shopping basket or tucks it coyly under her arm. And the man in the know gets the message that the coast is clear. I suppose the housewife who is not love-hungry buries the Omo packet at the bottom of the basket under the new potatoes or tucks it brazenly under her leg. At this point, the son again wheels on a tame psychiatrist. Every woman craves excitement and male attention. The bored housewife yearns for thrills, illicit sex and intrigue. Standard stuff so far, but here comes the breakthrough. The box of Omo is her Matahari badge. It is the symbol of the clandestine relationship. The scene may be Tesco's or Sainsbury's, but to her, it is Casablanca or Tangier's. And who can forget that scene in Casablanca when Humphrey Bogart first clapped eyes on Ingrid Bergman tucking Omo coyly under her arm. Play it again, Sam. It was never any part of Paper's philosophy to practice sweet charity. Eight years ago, Harold Wilson's former secretary, Marcia, Lady Faulkender, was given her own gossip column in the Mail on Sunday. Alas for ambition, this snapper-up of unconsidered trifles came under the scrutiny of the then assistant editor of the Daily Mirror, who gave her polished, feline point of view. Marcia Faulkender. The other side of politics. According to the Mail on Sunday's front page, the second issue under the new editorship of Sir David English... For years, she was at the very heart of the British political scene. 
They mean she used to draw up the honours list for Harold Wilson. She is perceptive, witty and more than occasionally wicked. Yes, but was it going down like souffle? Alas, in pudding terms, page seven of the paper was as indigestible as a school dinner. Tony Ben, if you want instant attention, I have found this is as good a way as any. Let's try that another way. Tony Ben, if you want instant attention, I have found this is as good a way as any. Let's try another part. Although I am no longer at the centre of things, I do get around, and in some ways I see things from the sidelines just as sharply as I did from number ten. Sadly, Marcia's sidelines turned out to be similar to those of the immortal Glenda Slag of Private Eye. Marcia asked us, Have you noticed that Margaret Thatcher's heels are getting higher and higher? Can't say I have. I have, and I find it immensely intriguing. You do? Why has she gone into high heels after wearing low ones for years? Is this a trick question? Well, I give up. Why has she gone into high heels after wearing low ones for years? I believe it is something to do with the Falklands War. Well, of course. Silly me. But Marcia had a further explanation. She has been spending a lot of time at the Northwood Bunker with all those admirals and air marshals. And there is nothing like a lot of uniforms and gold braid for making a woman want to put on her best makeup and highest heels. While we were still reeling from this perceptive, witty and occasionally wicked information, Marcia had another question. So, what do you think about Peter Parker? This is becoming like hard work. Go on, tell us, Marcia. He started wearing high heels. Anyway, I'm not playing this game anymore. What should I think of Peter Parker? In my view, he is absolutely perfect. I have never seen such a smooth man on the box for ages. I watched him several times and he was impeccable. The hair, the shirt, the tie, everything. This could not go on. But there was more. Marcia's last snippet began. What's in the name? To which I could only reply, answer your own bloody silly questions. Papers was never solemn. It's always had a serious commitment, but it tries to do it with a lightness of touch. When Richard Ingrams came to review the reports of Cecil Parkinson's resignation over the Sarah Keyes affair seven years ago, he set out to show how Miss Keyes had planted her bombshell at a crucial moment. Sarah Keyes talks to the Times of... Loving relationship. I implored him to tell Thatcher. Shock horror. It was apparently the publication of this article that precipitated the downfall of Cecil Parkinson. Keyes' statement forces Parkinson's resignation. Out! 2 a.m. drama in Blackpool. Tories rocked by Parkinson. The end of the affair. Parkinson resigns hours after jilted mistress speaks out. Looking back at the sequence of events, the Sunday Times Insight team told us... It was just after midnight when Keyes' statement was telephoned from Bath to the Times, where they held the presses for 35 minutes to change the front page. James Whiteman from the Telegraph took up the tale. The hours of trauma for the Conservatives had begun at 12.30am, when 10 Downing Street warned the Prime Minister's office in Blackpool by telephone that Miss Keyes had issued a statement and gave a precy of what it said. Mrs Thatcher, who had just left a party, turned ashen-faced, according to a colleague, when she heard about the new development. The Sunday Times Insight team gave us the next instalment in the gripping drama. When a very shaken Parkinson went to see Mrs Thatcher in her suite at 2.15 on Friday morning, they agreed to... Sleep on it. Perhaps in the forlorn hope that Keyes' statement would not make too much impact. But any such illusion was shattered at 6.10 when John Cole, the BBC's political editor, became the first of many to ring the Parkinson's room at the Imperial to ask for his comments. Cole, I should say, is that dour-looking Ulsterman who appears regularly on BBC News talking in barely comprehensible Northern Irish. I could quite see why an early morning call from this character would be regarded by poor old Parky as the last straw. Quite so. What the papers say has a format which has resisted all attempts to change or modernise it, and which relies on a presenter with a clear, cogent personal view, who writes with wit and insight and delivers with authority. Some journalists have elaborated very serious themes on news coverage, and one such is Paul Foote of the Daily Mirror, who tonight collected his award as Journalist of the Year. Here is how he opened his masterly report on the Gibraltar killings of three IRA terrorists. The great advantage of having so many newspapers in this country is that if one of them gets something wrong, the others can correct it. A marvellous example of that was this week's big story. Here was the award-winning Today newspaper's front page on Monday. Three IRA terrorists were shot dead in Gibraltar yesterday as they planted a 500-pound car bomb in the main street. 
One. Now, here's the Daily Star. Three IRA terrorists, one a woman, were shot dead by police in Gibraltar yesterday. They had just planted a 500-pound car bomb outside the British governor's residence. Two. What about the son? The evil gang, including a woman just released from jail for blowing up a hotel, were cut down in the street as they tried to escape after leaving a massive car bomb. Three. Now the Daily Mirror. The centre of the town was sealed off after the ambush while troops defused a 500-pound car bomb. Four. The Daily Mail reported... Police discovered a 500-pound bomb in a white Renault parked close to the Parliament building and the Governor's home in Real Street. Five. Now the Express. The bombers had planted 500 pounds of explosives primed to explode tomorrow. Six. What about the heavies, the qualities, the Financial Times, for instance? The car containing a 400-pound bomb... The FT can be relied on to get its figures right. A 400-pound bomb was parked outside a Jewish old people's home, a bank and an educational theatre. 500 yards from the residence of the governor, Sir Peter Terry. Seven. The Times, the paper for top people, was also worried about the governor. The 500-pound car bomb was found 500 yards from the rear of the residence of the governor, Sir Peter Terry. The Times printed one of those helpful little maps. Site of the shootings. Car bomb parked here. Eight. The independent, it is, are you, had an independent account. Bomb disposal experts diffused 440 pounds of explosives in a Spanish-registered car parked near the official residence of the governor, Sir Peter Terry. Nine. The Guardian, Conscience of the Nation, reported... A 500-pound bomb was later diffused with a controlled explosion by members of the Royal Anglian Regiment. Ten. And finally, the Daily Telegraph, the paper you can trust. Shooting broke out when the three were challenged by troops as they walked along Winston Churchill Avenue after parking their Spanish-registered Renault 5 containing the 500-pound bomb next to a petrol station. Eleven out of eleven. All certain that there was a bomb. Were the three people armed when they were shot? The papers were less unanimous about that, but some of them were confident. The son had found an eyewitness. A teenage boy who saw the shootings said, The gang were ordered to surrender. They were armed. The same teenager told the Daily Express, Police took a gun from under the woman's jacket. Today had found the same witness. The teenage boy said, One of them was a woman, and they were both armed. On the other hand, the Daily Mail quoted a Ministry of Defence spokesman as saying, As far as we can ascertain, the three people shot were not armed. No weapons were found at the scene. So the position on Monday morning was this. Anyone who had read a national newspaper, perhaps 10 million people, would have got the definite and unconditional information that three people were shot in the street after planting a massive car bomb. Huge numbers of people would also have gathered that the three people were armed. What happened on Monday afternoon? Here was the last edition of the London Evening Standard. No bomb, no guns, but terror plot foiled. Says how? Says who? Says how? That's Sir Geoffrey Howe, Foreign Secretary, no less. In a statement which surprised MPs, Foreign Secretary Sir Geoffrey Howe said that the car which they had left parked in the target area did not contain explosives, and the two men and a woman shot by British forces yesterday were not armed. So all 11 papers have given their readers entirely false information. Foote went on to demonstrate how newspapers had become willing accomplices in official handouts and statements, with little or no attempt to check other independent sources. He rounded off his argument in an ominous and prophetic manner. The security forces are backed throughout by what is sometimes called black propaganda, sometimes psychological operations. This means, among other things, placing in the media stories which serve the security services, whether they are true or not. I spoke this week to Colin Wallace, who worked in psychological operations for the British Army in Northern Ireland in the early 1970s. Mr Wallace told me... The important thing is to get saturation coverage for your story as soon after the controversial event as possible. Once the papers have printed it, the damage is done. Even when the facts come out, the original image is the one that sticks. Do please remember that next time you read a story in all the newspapers about terrorism and who is responsible for it. Of course, apart from its annual awards, as tonight, the programme will always salute courageous journalism in a proper way. Here is Barbara Jones of the Mail on Sunday on the journalists who were actually present at the massacre in Tiananmen Square, Peking, last June. The Independence Asia editor, Michael Fathers, was beaten up by frenzied troops. Written immediately afterwards, the superb quality of this report was all the more remarkable. They pushed me down into a kneeling position and had another go at me, whacking me across the back with their rods and kicking, always kicking until I fell over. They pulled off my spectacles and crushed them into the ground. They screamed at me. Then they took me behind a stone lion guarding the gate. If this is the people's army, God spare China. He went on. The smooth face of the Chinese communist establishment appeared two hours later, dressed in cream flannels and a pastel T-shirt. 
the very image of moderation that the Foreign Office has come to believe is the new China and whom it can trust over Hong Kong. You have committed an unfriendly act, he said. I thought that was a bit much. You fell over, didn't you? That's why you have that bruise on your arm. I also had boot marks and bloodstains on my shirt from a baton blow. My right knee was swollen, my hips were aching, my trousers were ripped. They confiscated his notebook and let him go. But back at his hotel... I blubbed. I was weeping for the people of Peking. I cannot see how they are ever likely to trust their leaders again. Michael Fathers was not the only journalist to report his own deeply felt emotions. Here was John Passmore in the Evening Standard. People were screaming now, falling over each other, and the blasted bicycles were everywhere. Another burst, another five rounds. In the middle of it all, I had a very clear and shameful thought. I had always tried to keep a crowd between myself and the guns. Were there now enough people, enough ordinary, honest men and women, to be killed in my place? Papers has always relied on the relationship between the journalist and the off-screen voices, a teamwork which has created minor novels from the interplay of character and event in the press. Five years ago, Tennis and Number 10 were yoked by media hype. The press noted that Carol Thatcher, journalist and daughter of her indoors, had brought out a book on Chris Evert and John Lloyd, and that Mrs Thatcher was on hand to help with the publicity. Peter Mackay and the team fell on this with deep joy and used mischief and mimicry to potent effect. Author Carroll's famous mother was on hand to launch the book at a London party. Love all as PM blesses tennis thriller. The sardonic Frank Keating wrote in The Guardian. Mrs Thatcher was introduced to Ted Tinling, dress designer to the game, a totally bold lamppost of a man who sports a diamond earring. I dream about you, said Ted. How nice, said Mrs Thatcher. Could I thank you for saving England, said Ted. How kind, said the Premier. Sir John Juno raised in the Sunday Express the question of Mrs Thatcher bringing undue, not to say insidious influence, to bear on book lovers. The presence of the Prime Minister at the publisher's party to launch her daughter Carol's book on tennis stars Chris and John Lloyd meant that the occasion received infinitely more publicity than it otherwise would have done. The effect on the sales of the book may be considerable. And what does Sir John say to that? What do I say to that? I say good for Margaret Thatcher. Wouldn't she have been a cold, calculating fish if just to avoid possible sneers from political opponents she had refrained from offering a helping hand to her only and much-loved daughter? And wouldn't Sir John have been a cold, calculating fish if he had refrained from offering a helping hand to the woman who gave him the knighthood he craved and who might easily make the old rogue a lord one day soon? Next Friday evening at 7.15 on BBC Two, What the Papers Say resumes its weekly task of commenting on, comparing, criticising and occasionally praising the way the news is handled in the newspapers. Good night. Good night. There's nothing else to say except good night. Thank you and good night. Good night. I also say good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. No more, thank you. Once was quite enough. Good night. And just to reiterate, next Friday, what the papers say starts with a vengeance and the first of the weekly reviews will be presented by Journalist of the Year, Paul Foote, at 7.